Hey everyone, happy new year. Thanks again for coming to Vox Veritas, our online splash lecture series. I hope you're, uh, hope that you're having a good time in the 2015 year. Once again, my name is David Carrion. I'm a psychiatrist and neuroscience researcher at Stanford. Um, tonight is going to be lecture four on the neuroscience of happiness. Um, next week, I will be away, so there won't be a lecture. Uh, we'll email you out about when, the, uh, when we'll get started again. Um, in the meantime, I'm also going to send out a questionnaire to get feedback on the first two months of this program. So I would appreciate feedback. Please do fill it out. And a couple of info before we get started. Um, first of all, apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, it will be a little bit, uh, little bit uh, clunky today. Um, because of uh, one of the computers going down, but we will uh, we'll try to make it work. Uh, for the live audience, please ask questions via YouTube chat, Twitter, or email. I'll try to answer as many as I can before the end of the lecture. If you're not watching live, questions, comments, constructive criticisms are all welcome. Um, in the chat, rules are simple. Watch your language and no spam. If you break the rules, you get one warning before you're banned. To get unbanned, please send me an email. All right, um, so without further ado, I am going to uh, show you. Uh, we're going to be talking about. Uh, you know, so here's our uh, here's our splash screen. Like I said, a little bit clunky today, but um, neuroscience of happiness and neuroscience part four. Um, so we're going to be talking about prudence or wisdom today. Um, so if you remember in our uh, metaphor, uh, we talked about uh, the various the various different stages. We have the uh, the ship of our individual self. Um, we need to be able to to be uh, to to do well. We need to be able to uh, keep ship shape. We need to be able to uh, control our own passions, uh, whether it comes to negative things or positive things. We also need to be uh, have a good group ethic, get along with other people on the team. Um, and finally, today I'm going to be talking about the destination. I'm going to be talking about where we're actually headed and why it makes a difference that we have a place to head. Um, so, uh, also to review. Um, here are the uh, the, the uh, four cardinal virtues again. If you remember, courage, dealing with uh, negative uh, negative stimuli, negative things like uh, like fear and pain, and, and what to do in response to those. Um, and here's temperance, temperance having to do with positive stimuli. Um, how do we how do we respond to uh, temptation? Um, and finally, over here uh, is justice. That is the uh, the uh, the virtue related to uh, dealing well with other people. And today we're going to be talking about prudence, making good decisions. Um, so just to uh, just to dwell on uh, prudence a little bit, um, being able to there's a lot of different things that could be said about prudence, and it could be said about um, about wisdom in general. I think I'm going to uh, to focus on on two aspects. I mean, this is this is a, a very very deep subject, and uh, a lot has been um, said and thought about it. But I think that. Uh, but I, I think the, uh, the 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 focus is is kind of on the is on the uh, the practical wisdom, but I'm gonna uh, uh, also talk a little bit about the uh, about wisdom on a, a different level. Um, so we'll uh, we'll we'll I'll say more as we as we go ahead. So um, I'm gonna this is a uh, a picture of the train tracks going into Auschwitz. Um, and why am I showing you this at the beginning of a uh, lecture on purpose. Well, the, uh, this is a, uh, th this is, this is a, a picture from, that was important in the life of a guy named, um, Victor Frankel. He was a, a Jewish psychiatrist who was taken to the camps, um, during World War II, um, where all of his family was killed and he was very close to dying, um, many, many times. And, uh, the, a lot of uh, questions were asked about, about, um, what it was that got people through this experience, and uh, you know, a lot of people expressed opinions about um, you know about uh, uh, strength or toughness or some of these other virtues. But but Frankel had a, a different opinion. He thought that the reason, the thing that made people get through, the people that gave, the thing that gave people strength to endure the worst of these circumstances was purpose, was being able to cast their suffering in some sort of a larger story. Um, so Frankel says, uh, Frankel says this, he says, striving to find in one's, uh, si striving to find meaning in one's life is the primary motivational force in man. <clears throat> and 
this is this is a uh, this is a really um, a really kind of uh, shocking statement. I mean, there, there's a lot of motivations we have. We've we've got motivations for uh, for pleasure. We've got motivations to avoid pain. We've got we've got motivations to be uh, to have uh, freedom and and power over over uh, our our circumstances. Um, but what he's saying is that meaning and this the 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 will to meaning, the striving to find meaning, is actually what is what life is all about. And um, so, from one perspective, uh, we want to talk about uh, what happens when you don't have meaning. Um, and so they did a study, and this study was was in uh, older adults, and they looked at uh, they looked at um, purpose in life, purposefulness, and they asked various questions and had a a um, survey that they gave these older adults, and then they looked at um, at how many of them survived in the follow up survey. Um, so here is the uh, here is the 90th, here's the 10th percentile, this top black line. And uh, as, as time goes by from year one to year two to up to five. And at year five, the older adults, because they, they were pretty aged to begin with, about 20% of them had passed away. Now, if you look at the people who had the 90th percentile, much more meaning in their lives, much more purposefulness. Look at this. They're at about 10% chance of dying. So you, you, you have just about, in this particular situation, you have just about uh, twice, you're twice as likely to die if you have low purpose than if you have high purpose. That's a huge difference. And you think, well, like, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with your health. I mean, it's not a, it's not a physical need. It's not like food or drink or something like that. But it turns out that it seems like this is something that we need to, uh, to even have our, our uh, physical body continue on in, a, in, a, in an important way. Um, okay, so here is, uh, I'm going to show you um, another question about um, purpose and meaning um, is what sorts of, we've been talking about the neuroscience of happiness, but I want to I sort of broaden the question just a little bit. So the question is, um, do people just want this the the happiness in the sense of a positive state, um, being able to uh, to smile all the time or to be in a good mood. There's a lot of things we do that don't make us do that, but but are really important to us. Um, so they did a survey asking people, um, what extent to uh, what extent does each of the following activities reflect you? Um, and then they um, they they looked at them and then they they correlated how happy the people reported being in various uh, in various ways and how meaningful they felt their lives were um and so uh if you look at this uh if you look at this chart over here people whose whose lives are characterized by eating or partying with alcohol they don't have um they're not particularly they, they don't have particularly any increase or decrease in happiness or meaningfulness whereas partying without alcohol has an increase. These people are much more happy than otherwise. Um, here's socializing. People whose lives are characterized by socializing, um, their lives, they tend to have more meaning and happiness. People whose lives are characterized by having sex, su uh, maybe surprisingly, have more meaningfulness, but not more happiness. Worrying, people who worry a lot tend to have much less happiness, but do find their lives to be more meaningful. Uh, and then look at these meditation and prayer, huge correlations with states of meaningfulness, um, but not of, uh, not of happiness. And over here, buying gifts for others or taking, ca uh, taking care of kids, huge, huge, more than anything else in the survey, um, uh, correlations with meaningfulness um, and, you know, slightly less happiness than, uh, than the rest of the survey. Um, and so again, the, all of these studies are very limited, and they're they're trying to answer big, giant questions with uh, with kind of a, uh, a simplistic approach. But one of the things I think we could take away from that chart is is saying that you know there, there's some of these things work at odds. I think uh, if if you spend your life buying gifts for others um, or sacrificing for others, you don't you're not necessarily happier per se, but it does reflect something deeply true about you and who you are. And that's um and that's really um and that's really important that people um people will pursue these things. For example, um having children, people will have children, um and that this this really increases the degree of meaning in the in people's lives by a huge degree. Um and so 
I guess the, the, the deeper sense of happiness, the, 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 the happiness that is more than just the mood state, um, has to include some of these, some of these other deeper pursuits um, that, are, that are not just, uh, not just simplistic and fun. Um, another paradigm um, that I want to talk about in terms, of, uh, in terms of happiness and purpose and goal is, uh, is a paradigm um, that was developed around uh, by, by positive psychologists, psychologists who wanted to stop looking at just the sad things that were happening and look at the people who were mentally ill, but to look at people who were flourishing. And one of the paradigms that came out with this was um, a concept called flow. And the idea with flow is that um, you have various things that you do um, and you have various things that you do that have various levels of challenge, from low challenge to high challenge. And then in those activities, you either have low, you, you have a range from low skill to high skill. And so if you have low skill and low challenge, that leads to apathy. If you have low skill and, high, and medium challenge, that's worry. High challenge leads to anxiety. Um, but really what you're trying to push towards is this end of the spectrum. If you have high challenge, and high skill that leads to a state called flow flow being this uh, this this sense of being with other being so into the activity that you lose track of everything else that your whole attention is focused on the thing that you're you're doing and so um the researcher who developed this mihai chitsent mihai um did this uh, study with uh studying people who were for example um expert uh, expert musicians who when playing difficult pieces, had to get to this extreme level of, of difficulty with the piece and extremely high skill, and they were able to enter this state. And people find this to be intensely, um, very much, uh, very pleasurable. The most pleasurable things we do are challenging work um, that have this combination of high skill and high, um, high challenge. Um, and so uh, another... Uh, another study that was um, was done. Um, they, they they look at uh, they look at um, life satisfaction and uh, how um, how happy you are with your life. And it turns out that a lot of these studies are showing that doing things like volunteering or donating to charity actually increase your own happiness. Now, this might not be surprising to those of you who do these things, um, but they they increase your your um, happiness by a an astonishing degree, um, and you remember the uh, the the comparison I gave uh, uh, last week about the uh, social connection. Um, I talked about uh, the uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars, the the uh, roughly the huge amounts of money that you need to increase your happiness um, by by money, and it's much better to do it through social means. Another one of the ways to increase your happiness. Um, by about $100,000 worth of income a year is volunteering on a weekly basis. So this is a, another, another thing that leads to huge increases in our life satisfaction and happiness that we don't tend to do um, as, much as, as much as we could and as much as we, uh, is, because we don't really think of it as, as leading to happiness. It's something that we ought to do, something that we kind of have an obligation to do. And so I, I think what I want to do is, is encourage you um, encourage you to think of your life as a book. Um, and you're, you're writing, you're responsible for writing this book. You're responsible for, um, for filling out the pages. And, and you fill out the pages second by second, minute by minute, day by day. And however, however many years you've lived, you have that many years of, of life that you've written out. And you, however many years you have left, you're continuing to write this book day by day. And so... I guess the uh, what this um, what this this part of the the lecture series um, in this part of the lecture series, I want to encourage you to to think about what is the book about. What do you want the book? To, what do you want this book to to be in the end when you're done and finished and you look back on it and you say that was a that was a good book. How do you how is it? What do you need to have in that story? Um, and what sort of a story do you want to tell? And uh, I think uh, to to give uh, one example, there's a there's a a classic split. This is a a famous painting by uh, Raphael, not the Ninja Turtle, um, the uh, the painter, who uh, talked to, who described um, the school at Athens, and you see sort of this this paradigm 
um, between the two major thinkers in the, in the Western philosophy. Um, this guy over here on the left, um, this is Plato. And Plato is pointing up in the, into the heavens, into the sky. Um, Plato's philosophy is very much an idealistic philosophy, a philosophy focused on um, the, the spiritual things, on transcendent things, on things that are, are non-tangible, non-material. And this here represents Aristotle. Um, Aristotle, on the other hand, was uh, much more down to earth. And so you could see his hand motioning down to earth. Um, not entirely materialistic, but, but having a, a balance between the material world and, this, and the, the spiritual world. And it's sort of this, this, this dichotomy between um, the uh, ideals, the, uh, the spiritual, the transcendent, and, and then the, the pragmatic, the practical, the, the down to earth. Um, this, is, this has been a constant tension in the, uh, in the history of thought in the West. And so um, one, of the, one, of the, 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 one of the sets of stories you can tell, or one kind of story you can tell, is a life of action. Um, and I think this, this involves a lot, of these, um, a lot of the first few weeks that we talked about, um, the virtues of courage and temperance and justice. And the question is, um, so, so lives that would be active, would be lives, um, lives like a, a life, um, uh, serving, um, serving in uh, as a as a doctor, uh, healing the sick, or um, or building things, or working. I love this uh, this classic photograph of a man working, or um, or even um, on the uh, the side of uh, of, of uh, social relationships, uh, connecting with, um, spending time connecting with friends and family, making your life about um, about that uh, that connection with other people. Um, all of these things being uh, being very very pragmatic and down to earth things. Um, another path or another uh, another kind of story you can tell um, is a life pursuing the uh, the transcendent things. Um, and so uh, examples of this life are are, are lives of, of contemplation or meditation. Um, this is uh, Mother Teresa or or seeking out experiences of the tr of transcendence of of stepping outside yourself of seeing yourself as as being part of, of something bigger. Um, and so uh, these, are, uh, these are two possible pathways. Um, and I, I think that um, one of the, this is a, another, another image. This is uh, by Rodin, um, a sculpture. You've probably seen it before. It's called The Thinker. And uh, I think that uh, you've probably seen it way more times and it's been, uh, it's, it's so classic a sculpture. You've seen it too many times and it's kind of boring. Uh, but I want to point out a few things in the sculpture um, related to what we're talking about today. So um, the first thing is um, this guy's totally, totally ripped. He is like, look at how muscular, he's just bulging with muscle. Um, and, and one of the things that Rodin was able to do, he wanted to depict thinking, but depict it not as a boring static thing, but as a dynamic thing. And so by switching the elbow uh, to resting on the opposite knee, you get this, this twisting motion of the, of the torso that he's active. He's about to spring to life. This is not a static thing. And so I think in this sculpture, you get this, this, uh, this representation of the, the, the life of thought and the life of thinking as this combination of both the action of the muscles that this guy clearly, the, the physical actions this guy clearly had to be doing to get these muscles and the thought involved with his, um, with his, with his activity. Um, and I also want to talk about uh, the, uh, the, the journey. Um, I, I, uh, I talked about a, a book, but this, this particular book, the Odyssey is a classic in the West is a, is one of the very first um, epics, the very first stories that we've told um, about uh, to try to make sense of our world and our life. And it's um, the Odyssey is about a journey, a journey of Odysseus coming home. And I think that uh, that th this is this is uh, it's, it's got all of the elements of of him being a master of himself, him being able to uh, to have social virtues. He's a leader of other people. He's able to get along with other people. And I think the um, and, and finally, he's got a destination. He's headed somewhere specifically. And he in his case, he's headed home. And it's a story about uh, uh, the hero, the, this this journey to get back to um, his home. Um, and so I'm going to uh, to review and say that uh, we're starting again with this idea of the individual self, the individual, um, the 
individual part of the journey, seeking after being able to have this ship float and have the ship navigate by itself, have all of the, the sails in place and the, the, the rudder set and having it not be full of holes. This is a, a, a critical first step of the happy life is being in control of yourself. And second, the second step is being able to get along with other people and, and being able to, um, to, to not, uh, not get into fights and be able to resolve conflict and be able to, um, to, to, have a, um, to have things in common and communicate where you'd like to go with other people. And then finally, um, having a destination, having a place to go, having some purpose, some direction, some mission in life, something that you can do that no one else can do. So having some, some task that is special to yourself. And so I think um, in terms of destinations, I want to describe, um, describe a, few, um, a few possible um, destinations um, that have been popular throughout the, throughout the ages. Um, I think one of them is, uh, this is the, uh, the birth of, of Venus. Um, it's a, a famous painting, but I'm, I'm going to use it to represent um, hedonism. Um, and hedonism being the, the idea that, that pleasure, that um, your own, that, that one's own pleasure is the meaning and purpose of life that I'm going to, I'm going to uh, be temperate. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to be uh, just, I'm going to be prudent. And I'm going to direct all of this toward the end of trying to maximize my own pleasure, my own physical pleasure. Um, that's, um, that is, that's one path. And even we, and we can even, um, there's even sophisticated ways of doing this. We can even build a society around this idea and say, we want to achieve the most pleasure for the most number of people. Um, that's one way we can approach um, approach the the idea of um, of, of of a goal of a, of a destination. Now, I think um, modernly um, there's another uh, another idea. This is a, another famous painting, uh, Norman Rockwell of um, of uh, a Thanksgiving meal, um, and I, I this represents the idea of a uh, social flourishing. Um, I think another another goal that a lot of people set for themselves is not so much my own my own physical pleasure. Um, but I'm going to use all of these things, all of these skills that we talked about, all of this ability, and I want to direct it toward a, a social connectedness, a social flourishing. Um, there's a, a big advocate of this is uh, Matthew Lieberman. He, I just read a book of his um, called Social. And uh, the, the, the argument is that this is that, that humans can get along best if we work together and, and, and create these societies of social cohesion, that the end in itself is this is this interconnectedness, is this sociality, is this community. Um, that is, that's another direction that we can point to um, for all these things. Um, and yet a, a third one is pointing to, the, uh, pointing to something ultimate, pointing to uh, sort of a, the, 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 the final end of all of these things. That, um, that yes, pleasure is, physical pleasure is good, but social pleasure is better. And yes, social pleasure with other human beings is good. Um, but this is just a foreshadowing of some ultimate reality, ultimate good, an ultimate love. So, for example, in the case of a, uh, of a Christian worldview, um, the idea is we're all pointing towards this ultimate goodness of, of love, um, that, that uh, the love that we have for each other in community is just is, is a reflection, is a outflowing of the love that we, ha that we could have for God. Um, other conceptions of this, this ultimate divine um, involve merging together. The uh, um, Eastern conceptions have the idea of uh, the, the loss of the individuality, um, uh, a drop dissolving in the ocean. Um, and, and this being a, a motivating um, vision and an idea, an ideal or, or end or purpose or direction that we're all um, headed towards. Um, so I think the, uh, this, uh, this is, this is, bringing us towards the end of our, uh, of our lecture series on this. Um, but again, to remind you, we have courage. We have to, to uh, deal with painful things and anxious and things that are anxiety provoking and to be a, a fully functional uh, human being, being able to deal with that is really important. And even more so today with um, all of the uh, pleasures and, and uh, things that we have, being able to be uh, temperate and manage that um, is another important thing. And then uh, being able to be just with our neighbors and friends and, and coworkers. Um, this is an, another essential thing for being able to thrive as a person, but it, it all doesn't really matter 
if we can't, if we don't have a direction to go, if we don't have a, a place that we're headed, if we don't have a story to tell, um, we could be uh, incredibly capable, an incredibly capable fleet of ships that has no destination, that's uh, sailing about lost in the ocean. Um, and so I think uh, I want to encourage you to, uh, to, to make that journey, um, to, to uh, first of all, make your, uh, to, to find out the ways that we can improve and, and, uh, and better your, your own ship. Um, how, can you, uh, how can you make improvements in your own self? How can you make improvements in your community? And finally, how can you find a destination? Where can you look? How can you, um, what story do you want to tell? Uh, where would you like to end up um, at the end of your life? Um, so I think that uh, th these are these are the questions that um, that I want to leave you with, and um, moving forward. So I think the um, the uh, first question is: uh, Can you talk more about the study with uh, meaning in an older person's life, making them less likely to die? What did older people in the 90th percentile say was their purpose or meaning in life? Um, it's an excellent question about um, how, uh, what is the, uh, what are the implications and the significance of this study? So again, um, we have people with a, a low degree of, of meaning and a high degree of meaning. Um, and in the study, they didn't actually ask them specifically what their meaning was. And um, even Viktor Frankl, um, the guy who talks, uh, who, uh, who wrote this whole book on the, the meaning of life and the meaning of, of, of purpose and pleasure, he didn't have a specific. Uh, he didn't. He didn't require that people have have one specific goal. Um, he was more uh, generally open to it. I think that this is um, this is the the first step, having having some sort of direction. And I think that um, it's a, a very interesting discussion about what are the what you know what what is what are good or or are there better or worse destinations? Um, are there are there better or worse stories that we could tell ourselves? Um, uh, question two. Is purpose or meaningfulness, et cetera, different between males and females? Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, I think that uh, there's certainly, um, anecdotally, um, there are there are tendencies of um, of people talking more about one or the other. This might be um, this this very well may be social conditioning. Um, that is to say, um, men should expect to uh, find the meaning out of a meaning and purpose out of their their professional work, their work outside the home. Um, and women should find their um, should find their satisfaction in child rearing. Um, that being said, there's plenty of people who um, are my colleagues and friends who are women who find their their purpose and, and calling in their professional work and are not as interested in um, in motherhood or things like that. So I imagine that there are tendencies um, in certain directions. Um, I think that uh, that though at the same time it's it's uh, very difficult to separate out the the idea of uh, what is you know what are what are our purposes um, versus what are the purposes suggested to us by our culture, by our society, by our social groups, um, and do our social groups know what's best for us? Um, I think these are all very uh, very interesting and challenging questions. Um, and uh, did uh, question three is did Plato and Aristotle see eye to eye um, about the four virtues? Um, it's, that's another great question. Um, I think that uh, for a, a full and mature answer, um, you should probably ask a philosopher. Um, in my own reading, I think that the um, the general the, the the general gist is similar. Um, that certainly for uh, virtues of courage and temperance, um, the ideas the, the ideas are are very closely aligned. I think that. Um, for Aristotle, he broke it out and he listed out um, a lot more virtues than um, than Plato's four. And even with, with uh, Plato, Plato didn't explicitly say there are four and only four. Um, but um, but he did sort of uh, uh, you know, talk talk about these um, these four. Um, so I think that um, in general they they did see um, pretty close to eye to eye, um, at least on the big points of. Uh, in contrast to I think how how we would look at virtue, um, I think they're a lot closer to each other. Um, than they are close to us. And uh, question four, um, and are you saying that we should all have one ultimate destination or can we have many, um, many destinations? Um, it's another great question. I think that, uh, I think that the, the purposefulness questions are, um, are, are, or it's going to be an interesting thing to see as these questions get more specific and as we sort of uh, uh, dig down into the data about um, 
is it is it possible to have multiple different destinations? Um, I think in the end, we're writing just one story. Um, I think that we we have in our or there's going to be a, a, a you know it, it's like we're writing a book and the book is only going to be um, we we have only one life, and I think the question is is that are the destinations that we're seeking are the destinations that we're seeking is it a better idea is it a good idea to have a singular destination a singular focus or a singular narrative to organize our, our life or is or is it um, okay to have many and i think for um for some people i think that they'll say that um will you know i'd like i like many different things i'm going to pursue many different things but i think ultimately even in that story where we have multiple different pursuits there is an organizing principle. Um, it's after it's after happiness. It's after freedom. It's after it's after commu community. I think that um, by and large, most people do have these. Uh, you know, do, do do tend to focus on one or the other of these um, options. And I think it's an important thing to reflect on. You know, what are the what are the things that that we focus on? What are the things that we have been um, pursuing or or uh, or driving towards? And, uh, and are those things the things that we want to be? Are those things the best things? Are those things the truest things? Um, so I, I think that um, this, the, the, these questions are, um, I think that the, the end of this lecture um, is the beginning of a, uh, a very deep, uh, a, a set of very deep questions. Um, and I think that uh, I, I <laughs> at least in this series, I just wanna raise the questions um, and uh, challenge you to, um, to, try, to find, try to find the answers. So uh, I think uh, that that is it for um, us this week. I think uh, we're going to. Um, I'll uh, send you an email about uh, when we when we get back. Um, we appreciate your support, and again, if you're interested in uh, in these topics, let us know. If you have other ideas for topics, um, let me know, and uh, we will uh, we will continue soon. So uh, thanks again, and uh, see you soon. Bye.